central sort of person, I'm afraid. <laughs> How was that process of um, scoring Caravaggio? Because, you know, I know that um, you said that Derek had kind of recorded lots of authentic sounds from Italy, but then also, I suppose, there was maybe you know, resistance to you, you know, your first time on a feature film kind of scoring this film coming out of nowhere. Well, obviously, it was, a, it was a big break, really. I mean, the producers were worried. I think um, Derek wasn't really worried. And he just asked me flat out if I could do it or not. And I said, yes. And he said, are you sure you can? And I said, yes, I'm absolutely sure I can. You know, I thought, well, you know, with sort of what I know and feel about music, that I should be able to do it. And, of course, as a composer, you rely actually really on great musicians. You know, you don't have to play it yourself, as it were. So, you know, there are always going to be arrangers and great musicians involved if you've got the money to pay them. And so, you know, we just sort of got the best people we thought we could get involved who happened to be really good because we were recording traditional sort of instruments anyway, orchestral instruments of the period as well. So um, it was just a matter of sort of looking for the people who could play authentic instruments as near as damn it. And um, I just sort of relied on my sort of, I don't know, just my small knowledge of classical music and a lot of luck and lots of help from lots of people, you know. But it was a risky, it's, it's always a risk, you know, if somebody gets their first job at composing music for a film, you know, you take a risk. But Derek was, I think, you know, I mean, he took a risk with lots of people, you know, be it Sandy Powell or the actors he worked with, um, you know, it's something you could say that totally was a risk, you know. She'd never done a film before and there she was in Caravaggio. Yeah. Following that baptism by fire, yeah. how would you say that you now approach, or you did in the later films, you approached um, scoring a film? You know, is there a, a set process that you go through, or is it as varied as every single film that you work on? It tends to vary from every single film, really, but I just like to get in early, you know. I think that the more time you have to think about it, the more valuable that is than anything, really. I mean, it used to be really that people used to phone up, you know, once they'd finished editing the film and they'd say, we've got to be finished in three weeks, you know, we'll send you a video. Can you do it? You know, and in three weeks you'd have to write it and record it. Which I think happens a lot in TV these days, in TV films. But, um, you know, what I suppose I learned through Derek was that, you know, if you can get on board early and uh, work while they're shooting the film, then almost by the time they finished shooting the film, you could have done a major amount of work. And that's still how I like to get involved in films from an earliest point as, as possible. So that I, I can work with the actors and I can go on location and I can just talk to people and I can sort of really get under the skin of the film and try and, you know, get slightly deeper than maybe just coming in at the end and just going, OK, you know what I mean? You just, I, I, I like to sort of dig a little deep, I suppose. So really, nothing's changed. You know, I like to I like to dig amongst all of the, the sounds available. And you know, if you're if you're in Russia and there's a hundred extras standing around in the rain, you might as well get them all to do something. You know, clap or do something. You know, make a noise. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, if, if you miss the shooting, which is always an interesting event on a film anyway, if you actually miss the process of the shooting, then you're just left with sort of I don't know. I think you're quite a long way behind. Yeah. For me. For the Ozu film, um, I was born, but that you're going to be performing the live score with um, on Saturday the 6th um, at 6.30 at the Duke of York. How did that project come about? Because I know that this is actually the second time, I believe, that um, you've performed this live score, the first time being at Tilda Swinton's um, Ballerina Ballroom Film Festival. She just asked me. She just phoned up or she sent me an email saying, you know, do you want to do it? And I went, yes! <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's another yes, you know. And I remember the film, but I didn't remember it quite as clearly um, as I thought I did. It's incredibly difficult. It's not an easy film to do because it's all fairly realistic and it's a bit of a challenge, it must be said. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I figured out a way to approach it. I'm approaching it not really from a very musical angle. I'm approaching it from a sort of atmospheric angle as opposed to, you could say I was approaching it from an ambient angle, I suppose, more than... uh, uh, a musical angle. More of building a soundscape as opposed to just a full... Yeah, because it's impossible to hit cues and everything like that. You know, what do you want to hit musically? What do you want to do emotionally? I don't think it works just with one instrument all the way through it. So that's difficult. It's not as though you could just sit down on the piano and sort of underscore it. So what I try to do is just to sort of, I don't know, experiment a little, but try and make things sort of authentic. For instance, you know, I do have sounds from Tokyo, suburbs and things like that. They're very modern, but the film, of course, is set in 1934 or something before the war. So 
I quite like that, you know. It doesn't worry me. I've got lots of old things, I've got lots of new things, but I've got a lot of Japanese things. And um, thank goodness for the internet. It's great, you see, because I can email friends in Tokyo and say, can you run outside and, you know, see if we can get a tape of a ja traffic jam or something like that. It'd be really good. <laughs> you know, because then I can put a traffic jam in there. You won't necessarily see it, but I'm just trying to sort of open a, a key, a sort of oral key, I suppose, because... It's a very strange film. But once they get into the flow of it and they laugh, then they realize that actually you don't have to be quite a sort of... The great thing about watching a silent film is that you can actually sort of rattle your jewelry and eat popcorn without anybody worrying. You know, you don't have to stay completely silent. It's not a library, you know, it's cinema. You can laugh and, you know, you can do all sorts of things. But from my point of view, it's difficult because it's a scary area to move into for me. Obviously, when you play live in a band, um, there's a lot of you know the reaction coming from the audience that will therefore maybe affect how you will perform a particular song. Is that a similar thing when you're scoring something like this? You know, do, do you get the reaction back from the crowd instantly, and maybe it varies? You know, how you score the film. Well, I mean, I don't really think about this as scoring the film. I mean, when playing live, of course, you get reactions instantly, and this is this is a cross between sort of scoring a film and playing live so this is very odd I mean I think for me it's what it's worth you know I think it really helps if the audience is as noisy as rowdy as possible because a silent film is extremely silent if everybody in the room is sort of being extremely silent as well and it's very easy to put a toe wrong um, let alone a foot so you know I'm sort of diving in at the deep end and saying okay right here's some noise you know and hopefully it helps people to relax and help the images you're seeing. Well, we're all really looking forward to the screening, as I said, um, at the Duke of York's on Saturday the 6th at 6.30. And it was a pleasure to talk to you today on the podcast about that. It's my pleasure. It's not a problem any time. Brilliant. And yeah, we'll see you on Saturday, Simon. Marvellous. Many thanks. Thanks for joining us here on the Sydney City Festival podcast. Visit www.cine-city.co.uk to view this year's programme, book tickets and stay on top of all the festival news. You can also subscribe to the podcast while you're there to make sure you never miss an episode. The Sydney City Podcast is created in association with Director's Notes, the weekly film podcast dedicated to the what, how and why of independent filmmaking. Find it over at www.directorsnotes.com.